I sort of don't want to do this, but it should be done. Even though you could argue by topic alone it's been done many times. What evidence is there of God? There's actually a lot of evidence. But if you are an irrational atheist, you will deny it. So, I expect a great many I irrational atheists to comment and argue in the comment section of this video, and I'm just not going to reply to them. An irrational atheist insists on denuding God of his supernaturality and his immateriality, which is the only definition of God that makes any sense. And so they will deny the obvious things I'm going to say and just spout the junk that they spout. So, if you're an irrational atheist, you're going to know it because I'm just not going to reply to you. I'm not wasting my time on you guys anymore. The rational atheists are few. They will recognize the importance of what I'm going to say. And it still won't prove God exists because there's only one way to do that. But it will help you feel better about seeking that proof. Okay? What I'm going to say is going to be different from what you normally hear in YouTube videos and elsewhere. Otherwise, there's no purpose to make this audio. <clears throat> Perhaps the first and most important evidence of God, His own existence, is you. What Descartes should have said was cogita ergo sum. God thinks, therefore I exist. Instead, he went in circles and said cogito ergo sum. But what he was affirming there is an absoluteness of existence in the sense that he really does absolutely exist. In other words, he doesn't exist relatively. He really exists. It's a yes or no. That's what absolute is in math. On or off. Relative has to do with other things that are like the number and how that number relates to other numbers. God thinks, therefore I exist. The reason why that's so important is that the claim in the Bible is that the real that a human being is defined as a soul. Not the biology at all. At all. The human being is a soul. That's what distinguishes the human being from all other creation. The human being is directly made by God at birth. Genesis 2-7 and Genesis 1-26 and 27. You, the real you, is immaterial. Now, you have perfect evidence that you exist. You have thoughts in your head. Those thoughts cannot be measured biologically. Scientists have been trying for years, and they would especially like to be able to do it so they could figure out how to cure Alzheimer's and other diseases that affect the brain. They can't find thoughts because thoughts are not material. They're not biological. That's what distinguishes you from whatever is alleged as a hominid. Or pre-hominids, whatever you want to call them. If there really were hominids prior to Adam of the Bible, they weren't sold. They didn't have souls. And you'll notice that the Adam of the Bible is not a hunter-gatherer but a taxonomist and his own son, the first thing he does when he gets all pissy is he builds a city. So you're talking about settled people. Not hunter-gatherers. Settled people with a language and a culture. Because Adam's perfectly able to accuse God for Adam's own sin in Genesis 3. He's got full language capacity. He's actually a genius. Okay? So, the Bible definition of human 
is soul. That's you. You're the biggest evidence God exists. Specifically God of the Bible. So now the question is, well, okay, how do I prove that my thoughts are immaterial? And my answer simply to you is, go talk to any biologist you want. They can't read the thoughts in your head. They can't find your memories. The best they can do is find sensory pointers at various points in the brain, at various parts of the brain. You know, certain parts affect emotion, certain parts affect sense of smell, and memories are associated with emotion, sense of smell, eye pictures. Those kinds of things store in the brain. But the thoughts aren't stored there. They can't read them. They can only measure that synapses, you know, the synapses are moving. There's some kind of electrical, for lack of a better word, electrical current. So they know the brain is actually functioning, but they can't tell what it's doing. Now, you know, hello. The one way to prove God exists conclusively and right away... Well, within 30 days if you keep it up. Because you have to repeat this. Is to ask the ceiling, Hi God, if you exist, I need to know you. I need proof. Because the whole reason you're a soul is so God can talk to you. Let us make man in our own image means God wants a talking relationship with you. Now, it isn't going to be an audible voice because that's physical. God is supernatural and immaterial. God communicates by means of thought because you are immaterial and God is immaterial. There's an affinity, therefore, and he can communicate to you. And then the question is, you know, how do we know we're not hallucinating? And the answer is, you can know that if you keep repeating the test and test the information you think you might have gotten. Because you should know the difference between your own thoughts and thoughts that occur to you that aren't like you. You should know the difference between your own intelligence and intelligence that's much higher than yours. And if it's God, he's obviously not going to tell you something stupid or nonsensical. He's not going to communicate or send you thoughts which are nonsensical because his intellect is higher than yours. Are you willing to test that or you're not? But that's the, really the only way you can get definitive proof. Everything else I'm going to say is just evidence that, the, you know, that, that what I'm telling you now is a good thing to do. Number one proof that God exists is you. And the Bible says the real you is a soul and that your body is just a house you walk around in. In the Hebrew of Psalm 139, that's what it says. It's mistranslated, so you can't see that in the translation. In my pro-life blasphemy videos, I started some um, exegesis on it, and then my no womb life dot htm goes through the full exegesis of that passage. Your body is just a house you walk around in. You're not a you until you're born. Because the fetus has to be able to be capable of independent life before God's going to create a soul and impute it to that fetus. And there's only one soul. You didn't have a pre-existing soul. He creates it at the moment that the body exits the womb. And then it's up to him to decide whether you're going to exist or not. And then he fashions that soul tailored to that body and those parents and all the things he foreknows that you're going to choose and want and like and dislike so that you are, your freedom is maximized that's how he does it now how do you know if what I'm saying is true the only way you can know is to ask the ceiling and keep doing it for like 30 days because you, scientific observation requires that you do a, you repeat an experiment over and over and over and over again okay so the first evidence is you now, it shouldn't be too surprising that the second evidence is many, 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 many humans for a very long period of time 
the older you say the earth is, the older you say humanity is, the more evidence of this there's going to be of people all saying, yes, God exists. Scientific method requires observation and the collection of data. If there are many reports of an accident at an intersection by eyewitnesses, even though they're going to differ on the details, they're going to agree, yes, there was an accident there. That's evidence the accident really occurred. The same thing when you have lots and lots of witnesses saying, yes, God exists, I know him. Some of them, yes, you can log off or lop off or say, well, some of them are hallucinating. But not when you have like over 50% of the population of the world for thousands of years all attesting to the fact that God exists. It's really way over 50. It's more like 80. For thousands of years. You cannot just throw all that away and be a rational person. If it was science, if it was observations about anything else of that magnitude, almost no scientist would even bother to investigate. They would say, well, you know, everybody reports that the sun is in the sky. So the sun is in the sky. I mean, consensus does have its problems. But when everybody's saying the same thing for so long, that means it's worth looking into. Because that's all I'm trying to establish here. You exist, therefore it's worth looking into because God says the real you is a soul. And you have evidence that you actually exist right in front of you, your every minute. So then it's only a question of, well, what is the real me? Okay. That's why asking the ceiling is the best way to find out. Quickest way to prove you're immaterial. And the, the concomitant part of that is the fact that you have thought that nobody can read. Second, so many people for so long, so consistently saying God exists. We have more observational evidence God exists than we do of any other thing or person in history. You can't just throw all that away and call it flying spaghetti monster. We have more people attesting to the fact that God exists than we have attesting to the fact that Hong Kong exists. And it goes all the way back in history. And as witnesses always do, they vary in their details or their assessments of what it is they see and know. In this case, a who. Alright? And even if you threw out 80% of the population, you have a consistency that goes on for thousands of years. You can't throw that evidence away. If you do, you're dishonest. Because if that evidence was on some other topic, there's not a scientist on the planet in any age who would throw that evidence out. Because observational evidence is key to science. And then you throw it out, then you're being an irrational person. Now, observational evidence alone you see you exist, you observe your own existence, you observe the existence of all these people attesting to God. Observational evidence alone is not sufficient to establish a hypothesis, much less a theory. In fact, observational evidence could indicate more than one kind of hypothesis or theory. So the next step is the evidence that you ha can actually create a hypothesis which does, yes, point to God. Remember, I'm calling it a hypothesis. I'm not saying it's proof. But the existence 
of what I'm going to say next. The very existence of it can be tested, can be determined, and does by its very existence evidence the hypothesis that God exists. Strongly, actually. Number three. Now we're getting into evidentiary hypothesis. Okay? Because it, it, it actually forms a hypothesis at the same time that it's evidence. And yet it itself is not observational. Strictly speaking. It's more theoretical. Math. Set theory. Largest uncontainable set of attributes has to contain personhood. You exist, you're immaterial. Therefore, God should exist because he would be the largest uncontainable set because you're a person. Therefore, there should be a God person. Fourth, and all these are wrapped up together. Fourth, everywhere you look in the universe, you see displayed, therefore proven, the law of opposites. Everywhere, just absolutely everywhere you go. You can't operate without the law of opposites. The law of opposites is necessary, as a physicist will tell you. Because that way there's no loss of information. That way you have equilibrium. That's an economics term for what I'm talking about. That way you have stasis. The law of opposites operates absolutely everywhere. It's universal on everywhere, everything, every force, everything material. Therefore, by the same law of opposites, if there is a material universe, there is an immaterial creator of that universe. If there is the material, there is the immaterial. If there is material creation, meaning you and I can create things, then there is immaterial creation. And since the immaterial by definition is neither mass nor energy, then it impacts mass and energy. And of course, again, the proof of that is math. Math is law of opposites. Math is set theory. Math itself is the evidence, the witness here. Math is immaterial. It acts on everything material. Mass has no mass. Uh, math has no mass or energy, and yet controls everything that does have mass or energy, or both. You cannot invite the number one to dinner, but you also can't live without the number one. So you're dependent on invisible, immaterial math. For your very existence. So it stands to reason, logically, that if you yourself are, are dependent on the immaterial math for existence, A, you're probably immaterial yourself, B, everything material about you is actually the dependence, so C, instead of 3, the invisible, the immaterial controls the material, and of course you see that every day because your thoughts control what you do. You can't eat without your will. You can't type without your will. You have to will. You have to have thoughts in order to type. You have to will in order to pick up a fork. Immaterial math controls the material. Law of Opposites, Set Theory. See how all these things are tying together? The immaterial definitely exists, and the immaterial is definitely controlling the material. There are more immaterialities, however, than math. 
time is immaterial. Time itself is neither matter nor energy. Time is not a subset of space, or space would control time. Time is over space. Time controls space. All matter and energy is controlled by time, not the other way around. So even if you said space-time, which I'm not sure is a valid thing to say, even if you said space-time, it's the time that's controlling the space. If an item can be in the same physical space at two different moments in time, then it's the time that's controlling. So time is immaterial. You can't subrogate time to space. You can't subrogate thought to biology. You can't subrogate math to matter and energy. Matter and energy don't control math. It's the other way around. You cannot invite the number one to dinner. That's definitive. You wouldn't have the ability to be logical if the laws of math weren't operating. And the fundamental law of math is law of opposites. So if the material universe exists, there's an immaterial creator because you're a person. See how obvious this is? Now life itself is also immaterial. Because when you cut some flowers... All the biological components of those flowers are still there. There's no loss of the biology. But the flowers are dead. A human being, the second he dies, all of his biology, assuming that he died of natural causes, all of his biology is still intact. But he's still dead. Scientists have never been able to figure out, and they are pretty free to admit this, what life even is. Precisely because it doesn't have, there's no biological explanation. Things are working and they suddenly stop. Life is immaterial, and that makes sense. Life obviously controls the material. Because one minute a human being's alive, and the next minute he's dead, and the biology is still there. Just as it was that minute before when he was alive. What made it stop? Nobody knows. We guess at the causes of death. We actually don't know. We see that we observe so many times, so many witnesses. Of a heart attack occurs and then the person's dead. So we assume the heart attack caused the death. Because we witnessed it, we have many observations of it happening. We have many more observations of it happening that people say they, they know God. So based on observation, but based also on some kind of causal connection. We know that life determines the course of, affects, matter and energy. Because the biology is the same after death as before. Talking about the instant of death, it's exactly the same at the instant of death. And then after that it starts to degenerate. So, law of opposites would tell you the immaterial existed anyway, and now you have four immaterialities. Time, math, life, thought, your mind. So, those are kind of compelling proofs. Well, let's not call them proofs. Let's not go that far. Compelling sets of data, along with the fact that you exist as evidence of God, given the way the Bible defines it, given that also the observations of millions and millions of people for, you say how many years, thousands, at least thousands of years, have all attested to the fact that God exists. 
differing only the details the way people differ when they all witness the same event like 9-11 or a car accident. When you have so many people saying the same basic thing, then that basic thing is true. Now, since you have the observations, the first two items, and then you have the four immaterialities, and you have the fact that math itself, with set theory and law of opposites, gives you, as it were, a theoretical basis for pursuing the theory, because the law of opposites would, con would lead you to say God exists just by its own law. And then set theory plus the difference between true infinity, which is stasis, and infinite regression and progression, which is just really um, finite, ongoing, which couldn't be finite, ongoing if there weren't an absolute stasis to ground it. All those things are compelling arguments for the existence of God. Compelling, however, is not conclusive. But they justify any sane scientist going down the road. You know what? There's a good probability that God exists because of these things. Math can't lie. The law of opposites is all over the place. The meaning of infinity versus infinity is a stasis. That's central to physics. And every other kind of science. Can't have relative truth without absolute truth. One or zero is absolute truth. It is or it is not. Well, God is or is not. And all these things are pointing to a, a likelihood. Let's just call it that. Be real charitable. There is a likelihood that God exists because of these things. But that doesn't mean you can prove it just from these things. I can't say to you, oh, for sure God exists because of these things. Even if I were certain of it, which I would be. Because that's not what makes convicting proof. At most, you could say all these things I've stated, as powerful as they are, are circumstantial evidence. So now you need the defendant in the witness box to confess to the crime of being God. So you look at the ceiling and say, okay, here's the evidence pro and all those saying that God doesn't exist cannot refute these things. They can't. So God, now I need absolute proof that you exist. Please communicate to me through thought the way it is that you want to do it and cause me to know it's you and not me hallucinating. Only then do you get conclusive proof. Do that and read the Bible at times to do that. 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes a day. Always asking the ceiling about what you're reading. Because if God really wrote the Bible, He'll make it clear to you. And He'll cause you to connect the dots in your own life and connect the dots in what you're reading and connect the dots, period, in ways that you'll eventually figure out. If you do this for like a month, you'll eventually figure out, hey, you know what, that's not my brain. I'm not that smart. Yeah, so therefore it has to be God. And the bonus of doing this little experiment for 30 days, first of all, it's a true scientific way to tell. Because how any science would have to run something in the chem lab. The best advantage about this is that the whole spiritual life of the Christian, this is how it's supposed to work 24-7. Asking the ceiling, studying scripture, living on the Bible, constantly asking God. And I mean 24-7, I mean every minute on the minute. It's supposed to work like this. Okay, what should I be thinking, Dad? What should be in my head, Dad? 
What am I learning from this, Dad? What's the connection here, Dad? What do you like? What do you dislike, Dad? Because, I mean, if you care about God, you want to know those things. And there is no such thing as serving God. That's a, almost like a euphemism. If you have kids, you give your kids chores to do. You tell your kids they're obeying you because you know it will make your kids feel that their lives are worthwhile if they can do something for mommy or daddy. So you give them little chores, you give them little jobs, you give them pats on the back when they did something good. But what you're interested in is them learning it and benefiting themselves. But you make it into a language that they're doing something for you. Because they know they're young and they want to do something for mommy and daddy and they really can't. So you give them something. And then they think they're serving or doing good for mommy or daddy. What do you think God's doing with us? What do you think all those commands in the Bible are for? God doesn't need those things. We do. It gives us a fulfillment in doing something. Okay, so 24-7 we're supposed to be in communication with God and what really pleases Him is to see us learning and becoming more free and sane and rational and happy. He's not into lording it over. That's what men say about Him. But if you're really God, you're not into that. The real God is into benefiting what He creates. Because what can anybody do for Him? He's already got everything. He already is all power. So He doesn't need your praise, but you might enjoy praising Him yourself. I know I enjoy praising others, especially those who are above me. So ask the ceiling for 30 days, 15 to 30 minutes a day. Spend some of that time reading scripture and asking for the God to connect the dots. Pick the passages you hate the most or that bug you the most. And admit, especially if you've ever believed in Christ before, admit that you don't believe God exists. You're confessing the sin of disbelief. And you'll be surprised how much smarter you get if you do that. You don't have to feel sorry about it. You don't have to do acts of contrition. I get mad at God all the time. And what, is that a secret to him? No. Hi, Dad, this drives me nuts. You're driving me nuts, yeah? That's using 1 John 1, 9. And that speeds my spiritual comprehension because it's designed to do that. God wants you to live on truth. The truth is you don't believe in God. Okay, fine. Use that. Hi, God, I don't believe in you. You've just confessed that you don't believe in him. Fine. Now he, now the decks are clear and he can communicate to you through thought. Now, if you're not willing to go through those steps, then you're not a rational atheist. Because a rational atheist would be willing to run the experiment. And if you're not a, rash, if you're not a rational atheist then there's, there's nothing to discuss. Now, there's a kind of in-between rational and irrational atheist, one who says, oh, I don't want to face this question. Then don't face it. That's being honest. Then you're still a rational atheist who doesn't want to face the question. This is a daunting task. I know that. I deal with it every day because 24-7 the Christian is supposed to be in contact with God. It's humiliating. And it's not humiliating because God is putting me down. It's humiliating because I look at him and I see how gorgeous he is and I feel like a schlep. He doesn't want me to feel like a schlep. And that's why there are so many promises in the Bible and so many nice things said. Because when you see God, when you really see Him and you really know Him, you hate yourself. So if you as a rational atheist don't want to actually em embark on this experiment because you're, you know, as it were, dreading what it might lead to, understood. Can't fault you for that. The only thing I'll fault you for is being an irrational atheist. And if you are one, it'll show in your comments, and I just won't respond. 
if, however, you know, anything I've said is not clear, rational, irrational atheist, tell me what I didn't make clear, and feel free to yell at me and call me names, I don't care about that. And if I didn't make something clear, I'll try to clarify it for you. Peace out.